I wanted to say a big thank you to our sponsor, Talent Insights. Talent Insights are Australia's leading data specialist recruitment business. They are experts in recruitment strategy and delivery for analytics and data teams. They are the go-to recruitment business for all your data roles in Australia, and they can help both with permanent hires and short-term project-focused data resources. I've used Talent Insights in the past, and I've always found them fantastic to work with. Visit them at talentinsights.com.au. Welcome to another episode two of Data Futurology. In Data Futurology, we aim to bring the lessons learned uh, from AI leaders uh, from around the world. So we discuss the, the challenges that AI leaders are, have, are having um, in using, adopting, or scaling AI, machine learning, and data science in the organization. We talk about strategy, we talk about use cases, and uh, ideally find innovations that you can pinch from other industries um, or similar companies that you can apply to your organization. Uh, my name is Felipe Flores. I'm your host. Very excited uh, to be with you today. We have a different type of episode today where we're going to do a Q&A uh, session with myself. So uh, we, we just got off the, the back of our Advancing AI series um, where we had 13 episodes discussing different aspects of um, challenges that leaders face in adopting or scaling AI in their organization. So I'll quickly go through those topics that we had, kind of like to do a, a memory refresh. We had a lot of questions uh, during those events, uh, almost 200 questions. So um, one, one option that I have is to pick some of those questions and start going through those, and especially focusing on the unanswered questions. Um, but also I would love to get questions from the audience uh, who is who is joining live today. So if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A section in Zoom. Uh, for anyone that is seeing, um, likes a question that somebody else has put in, then you can give it a thumbs up so it will come up towards the top and we can start answering, answering those. Um, and yeah, besides that, I should thank our sponsor for this series, which is Talent Insights. Um, so Talent Insights are a, um, a recruitment company uh, operating in Australia. Uh, so if, if you have any opportunity to connect with the guys or um, show them some love, I highly recommend that you work with, uh, with Talent Insights. Uh, they've been sponsoring us for quite a while and they're just yeah top, top lads. Um, Fantastic. So from, from, from my side, maybe um, I'll do a, a bit of background uh, for the people that don't know, and then we can jump into the, the content of the AI, Advancing AI series, and then go into any questions. So for, for myself, um, I've, been, um, I've been working in data analytics uh, for almost 20 years. Uh, I spent about seven years at the beginning of my career in consulting. Uh, that was that included uh, freelancing uh, for a while, which is how I got my my start, and I was able to stay in Australia. Um, and then I I worked for um, large companies uh, and and small companies as a consultant in the analytics space. So that was IBM and a company that was um, originally based in the UK, but had about 20 people in Australia um, and it's been bought. Um, it, had a, it had a proprietary analytics product that they used. The major customer here was Telstra, so they did a lot of work there. And, um, and that's been bought and, uh, and consumed into larger companies now, but that was kind of like a 20 person consulting company. And I went in there just off the back of um, working at IBM and working at some of their largest uh, analytics projects in the world, which was exciting. Um, and then, uh, then I decided to start my own company. So I started a, a consulting company and um, with like no idea uh, of what I was doing. I, had a, I started with a, a colleague of mine and we were business partners. We got investment early on. So my, my colleague and I, we had a 40, 40 stake in the business, 40, 40% each. And then the, the investor that came in early uh, had 20%. And um, we, uh, this, this investor that we had, we thought we had jackpot with him because he had started and built a consulting company, which was very successful. He started a, a, a company and it, it grew, he grew it to getting it to 200 consultants. 
and then he sold. Um, and then he had this period where he was doing some um, board appointments and he was investing in startups. And we were one of the startups that we, that he invested in. Um, we took a lot of lessons from him and, um, and, and in looking back, a lot of the decisions that we made, um, especially on the advice that we took from him was uh, somebody that had a 200% consult. It, it had the mindset of somebody who has a 200% consulting company instead of a startup. So this is before, for example, the Lean Startup book came out, uh, which was is my, my favorite book of all time. Um, because we made all the mistakes, like we were spending money in people doing market research for us. We were spending money in people doing branding for us. We were trying to get um, um, trying to get meetings with people through this person's, so through our investors' contacts, uh, but they don't have anything sort of substantial or real to to talk about. So, as you can imagine, the first the first few months were rough, and um, and then we tried building a product as well, which we didn't get any. We, we didn't get any market feedback till it was quite late. Um, then we thought that the product was going to be excellent because we knew the, the issues and the pain points of people working in the analytics space. We tried to build a product to solve those that didn't work in the short term. Uh, so we went back and focused on consulting and um, we almost went bankrupt in the first year um, twice or maybe three times it was like super stressful uh, but then we we found our feet so we started doing some consulting and um and whenever we could put one consultant in a client site that gave us the margin to hire one software developer to work on our products um and that was a good a good model and um i was looking after mostly about the the um the analytics side the consultants sort of like the including the sales and marketing of that, and then seeing what pro what we could productize from what we were learning of about the problems on the client side. Fast forward a few years, we had um, three products that were, um, that did okay, like not like well enough, not, not excellent. Uh, one of them was in the mining industry, which is quite interesting. Um, and uh, we analyzed text, uh, from um, hundreds of thousands of journal papers, articles, technical reports from inside companies. And, um, and we plucked out uh, benchmark information that described uh, what were at the time the largest underground mine, uh, the, the largest undermine, underground mine caves uh, in the world. And, um, and we, that came out of a research project uh, that they couldn't, they were trying to collate this information manually. Uh, obviously, that was too slow, didn't go very well. Um, so we were lucky enough to get the, the job and it was funded by a group of about 12 companies in the mining industry, including mining equipment manufacturers, uh, mining companies and, and other people, other organizations in the industry. So we got a good a good insight into, into that industry and we built... Um, the, the world's first um, benchmarking platform for organizations to benchmark their development of this new wave of, of mines, uh, which are the, these um, super caves. So a lot, the largest underground mines in the world at the time. And um, what I learned about the mining industry at the, uh, then was um, they, they um, in the mining industry, everyone wants to be second and i was like how does that how does that work uh what do you mean you want to be second um took me a while to understand but essentially what happens is that they have so much at stake so if if there's a an error in in mining you have lives that could be lost you have equipment which are is worth like hundreds of millions of dollars which is at stake you have the mine which the like the the shape if it's an open pit mine the shape of the mine or the shape of the tunnel um, it needs to stay in, in a certain shape so it can, um, so it can be its most productive. So if that breaks, um, or if it changes shape, or if you have a kind of like a landslide or something, then the mine is not productive and, and the, the mining company is losing millions of dollars per day. So as a result, the innovation is, um, kind of slow and everyone wants to know whenever somebody else gets a breakthrough, 
and they want to adopt that breakthrough as soon as it's been proven safe and as essentially as soon as they can. So um, at the time, now I know that they have uh, better ways of, of innovating through little um, experiments, essentially, which is which is great to see. But so we built this benchmarking platform where people could log in and look at uh, the trajectory of mines around the world, uh, how their peers are going in like 120 different dimensions. And it um, and it would give them like the paragraph if they wanted. Obviously, the data was shown in charts with explanations, et cetera, but they could drill down to the specific paragraph that um, where that information came from and they could see the, the, um, the article and things. So that was that was really good. Um, comment from Jason saying, um, spending like you were corporate rather than an entrepreneur. I definitely made that mistake. Yeah, we did, unfortunately. And um, yeah, it's something that now I'm um, very wary of and I've sort of carried that that uh, painful lesson through uh, throughout the rest of my career. And even being in corporate, I was always um, very frugal and um, still still am today. Um, and so, yeah, quick, quick. Um, um, so I'll, I'll sort of speed this up a bit. Um, when I had my business, uh, we developed a couple other products. So we had the mining one. We had um, one which was around business process optimization for small to medium businesses. And we partnered with um, a well-recognized entrepreneur in, um, and business leader in the space. And we essentially built the tool based on his framework and then applied analytics and data science to that and became a self-service platform, which was great. And we mostly leveraged his network. Um, he was a very well-known guy. And we mostly leveraged his network to, to build up the, the initial couple of years of that tool and um, still going today. So that's really good. Um, and the, the other one is um, uh, was to do predictive analytics for uh, small to medium businesses uh, from their... Uh, financials. So essentially, uh, small companies would upload their financials from like Myob at the time, um, showing showing my age, and um, and we would run um, forecasting, uh, anomaly detection, uh, trend analysis. Um, um, we would we would bubble up the key drivers that were um, affecting that, and and give them kind of like a, a bunch of of canned reports coming out of analytics. And um, and that was that was um, that was pretty good as well. So we got we got traction. Uh, we got into the world of online marketing, and we got some traction um, worldwide with small to medium businesses using that product. And um, oh, during that time, we were building up the the consulting firm, which was great. Um, and then um, we actually had problems with our investor throughout that, um, who was borrowing money from us. Um, with us like knowingly so we, we knew about it uh, he asked us to borrow money to pay salaries in some of his other businesses and we sort of set up a contract to say okay that's fine but um, you can have the money for up to this amount of time I think it was like six months or like nine months or something and um, and then when we need it back uh, we will give you two weeks notice and you have to give it back and he agreed and we signed and then the time came that we needed the money back and um, he couldn't produce the money. <laughs> so um, that was, that was uh, very interesting. And um, it, it's eventually what happened was that we got um, another investor to come in and buy the shares of the first investor at the price that the first, or the money that went to the first investor was the, essentially the, the same price, maybe a little bit higher. But as you can imagine, the value of the company had increased significantly. So then the rest came into our business as, as cash flow, which was great. And um, we're obviously only able to negotiate that because of the um, very interesting and very <laughs> specific circumstances that we were in. Um, but that that got us through. Uh, we had some we had some some big clients uh, in the consulting side. So we worked with Foxtel, MLC, um, which is part of NAB. We worked with South Australian government, um, and uh, yeah, really really good, interesting time. Then over the years, um, my business partner and I started to um, 
uh, to diverge in our vision for the company. And um, he was a person that really likes to think about way in the in the future. And and um, like I, I would always say that he lives like five years or ten years ahead of the the rest of us. And that's that's how something that I really enjoyed. Um, but then we wanted to have different focus where he. Um, um, he wanted to be creating the essentially the tools of tomorrow, and I wanted to be solving problems that people had today in interesting ways. Um, so then that kind of like created more and more pressure over time, and then eventually I decided to exit the company. Um, so I sold my part. I found a couple other investors uh, to buy my my share. Um, some of my share went to my business partner, so he went up to fifty one percent. So he got a majority. Uh, ownership of the business, which was good. So then he had the the control, which we always wanted to keep between us. Um, and then the the yeah the company uh, still going today has a like different focus, and and that was that was a really good period. Um, and that was that was interesting. Like there was so many things that I did wrong, and so many things that I learned during that time. But it's been it was kind of like the best um, training ground because the stakes were so high and. Um, I just felt like I had to be improving so quickly. Um, so definitely taught me a lot of lessons and a lot of a lot of what's then helped me do well in corporate uh, was the lessons that I learned from my time as an entrepreneur. And the bug sort of started earlier for me because um, when I was at university, um, I worked at this research center where I ended up being part of a, a project where we were um, trying to find the uh, the tired of trying to measure tiredness fatigue in truck drivers in mines, and uh, we did that with um, with EEG. So essentially, we had um, three um, um, three sensors across the forehead and one behind the ear. Um, that there was an electrical engineer in the project who designed that, and it was um, like way ahead of his time. And um, and that allowed us to to get the the signal what was happening in, in the brainwave activity of people, and then um, he uh, gave gave me those those signals um, like amplified and, and really good. And then I digitized it and had an onboard computer that sat inside a baseball cap, and um, that the truck driver could wear. And um, I designed the the onboard computer and then had a a machine learning model uh, to go from brainwave activity to a number from one to five, where uh, when somebody went from number three to number four, as soon as they got to number four in tiredness, they couldn't drive anymore. And that uh, that scale came from sleep experts. So we had help of about a dozen sleep experts from around the world that gave us thousands of hours of footage, video footage of people driving with uh, their EEG. And they had like full um, sensor 12 node EEG, which we had to make sure that we were um, compatible with, which we did well. And um, and then that research project, um, this was kind of like early 2000s, that research project then became a, um, a commercial company, which is still running today. And um, that was really cool to see uh, early in my career. And I wasn't involved in any of the commercial side or any of the you know m- business or marketing or anything like that. I was literally just like, um, the project engineer um, in charge of building the the embedded system and the, the machine learning side, uh, but it was it was awesome. It was awesome to be able to see. So that definitely gave me the the entrepreneurial bug. Um, and and that uh, that company, yes, yeah, so I said, still works today, largely in mining industry. And um, last year, no, the year before, yeah, a couple of years ago, they raised about. $20 million to expand to other industries, including medical uh, for the for the long shifts and um, and long haul uh, truck driving in, on roads and and for trains, so freight type thing. Uh, so that was kind of like way, way at the start of my career. Then I did the consulting, um, freelance, large business, small business. Then I had my own consulting company. Um, and then uh, I went into ANZ and I was head of data science at ANZ and started the, um, the data science team for the institutional division, which is uh, by revenue, the largest division in, in the bank. Um, by headcount is about 10% of the, of the bank at the time. So um, 
ANZ at the time had about 50,000 employees. So it was 5,000 employees in this institutional division, which is, um, which is B2B. And the customers are large corporates. So publicly listed companies, multinationals, and governments. Um, and a lot of people warned me when I was going into that role to say, like, that part of the bank has 30,000 customers all businesses, all large businesses, but it has like, yeah, maybe less than 30,000 customers. And they're like, what are you going to do? Like they do, they do one transaction a year, two transactions max each because they would get like a huge loan or they would like um, get, get um, corporate credit cards or they would get like F post machines for all of their stores. So people are like, you're going to have no data. Like, what are you doing? Um, why are you going into that? And anyway, I thought it was a, an interesting, interesting challenge. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll figure something out. And um, yeah, first, first year was um, tough because there was a huge education piece. So nobody understood data science. Um, people didn't really care <laughs> about data science. Um, I would go and speak to business heads and executives and they're like, hey, you know, I'm, starting this data science stuff. It's great. Let's talk about what we can do for your area. And people like didn't take it very seriously, I felt. And they were like, yeah, quite dismissive. And if I was like trying to bring in ideas, um, they were like, oh yeah, like that sounds, that sounds fine. As a result, I felt like I was, um, and what happened actually was in the first year, I, um, I got some budget to get some consultants, which was great. And um, only a small team, uh, maybe like two two consultants. And um, we did a bunch of POCs and pilots. And like, I think we did something like 80 or 90 pilots in that first year for different different, uh, business areas, different business heads, different executives. And literally it was kind of like, throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what's stuck. Um, and, um, and as you can expect, like nothing really stuck. <laughs> like when you try to do something to see what happens, all you, all you learn is like, all you do is see what happens. Like it, it rarely leads to, to the big success and uptake that you, that you expect um so yeah did that for like yeah the majority of the year maybe like nine months and i was like this is not working <laughs> like nobody cares we're building all these dashboards they get shown once they, they 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 got into a lot of conferences people were showing them we built one for like beef week which was recently in, um obviously it happens every year and it's it's in may and this year it was in rockhampton and um anyway we're doing like all oh, uh, and obviously that's because of the the beef trade between at the time China and Australia was huge and Australia was growing in terms of the amount of beef that it was sending to to China but as a proportion of the um, of the amount of beef that China was buying and consuming Australia was shrinking so it was growing so fast that even though we were sending more beef um, as a proportion of what they were eating the Australian beef was was um, going down and Brazil was taking up our market share. Um, so we showed those type of market dynamics and that was really interesting and got shown in beef week. And anyway, a lot of kind of like a lot of air time, not air time. Yeah. Maybe a lot of air time in terms of like conferences and things were showing at work and literally like no business change, like nothing, not nobody was doing anything differently as a result of our, of our insights. Um, so obviously that's, that's, um, quite frustrating. And then, um, and then um, I was like, all right, we got to change. Like if people internally don't really care, then let's go externally. Let's go to our customers. And I was like, I was just running a business before doing this. Like I, I consulted to large companies. Uh, let's just go do that. And, um, and the differentiator that, that we had there was that I could use the data within ANZ, which was awesome. So it took me ages uh, to be able to, not only get the approvals um, to use data from other parts of the bank, from other divisions, but also um, get the approvals to gauges and then getting the data itself um, and getting the data access to gauges. But um, luckily, started to, to get some momentum. Um, 
We were seen favorable, favorably at the time by the chief technology officer. Um, he's no longer there, but he signed us off as a, as a learning project, uh, which was great, meant that we could use the cloud. And what we ended up doing was um, using data from the retail side, especially from credit cards, where ANZ has 22% market share at the time. Um, we use that data to give insights to large companies like Vodafone, like McDonald's, like Virgin, like um, a group of restaurants uh, that that like was the fastest gro growing group of restaurants in Australia. Um, companies that do men's menswear and like men's suits, and and that was a strategy that worked really well because we were leveraging. Uh, unique data assets that we knew they didn't have, that, that our customers didn't have, and we were giving them customized, personalized, actionable insights. And, um, and actionable to the point that we were telling and having discussions with companies like, like Vodafone around where they should open, they should build the next cell phone towers based on the type of customers that they have versus the other telcos, the amount of spend, the loyalty of these customers, where they're where they're based and where they're moving to. That that as a as a strategy um, at the bank at the time, that started to work. And we started automating the, the creation of these insights. And we essentially created this this software um, with some with a lot of machine learning um, that would intake all the, the credit card data and accounts and everything, obviously completely de-identified. Um, and then create custom analysis, analysis and at the beginning it was PowerPoint and then it evolved into a web app and then into APIs, but they were like custom analytics for each customer and then we would go and visit them, give them that. And that was kind of like a most successful product from, um, from at least my time at ANZ. We tried a few others, but that was definitely the, this offering was, was the, the key. And um, we, uh, we grew that team over the years and um, it was like awesome, awesome period of like high growth, high learning, uh, lots of customer visits, uh, lots of kind of like learning about different businesses, how we could help them with with our uh, unique skill set, data access, um, and then to the point that we started offering our insights as a value add when when customers bought the top three most profitable products that the bank had. And that was great because we got like right in there with the with the deals with the business side, um, and we had to react really quickly. Um, and then customers could buy our offering directly as well. Um, so all that like really good. Um, the team made like a, a, over a hundred million dollars for the bank uh, during during my time there, which was like unreal. We helped like get the biggest deals in in the bank's history. The bank's like 180 years old. Um, so yeah, super, super, super exciting, uh, really good. And the, the team is still going and doing really well. And I'm really, really proud, really proud of that team. Um, and then I took some time off, went on a, got married, went on a honeymoon, long honeymoon. Um, and that's when I started this podcast actually, which is now almost, this is like year four essentially. Um, and that was because, um, like Essentially, like uh, I kind of like said to my wife, which is uh, my um, well, girlfriend at the time, but wife now that um, I was like, oh, we're just going to, you know, be traveling and not doing much. I might, I might get bored. Um, obviously, that didn't go down well, very well. Um, but uh, she's, she's a good sport. And um, as she kind of like said half, well, mostly jokingly, she's like, well, you listen to podcasts so much. Um, what are you, what are you doing? Um, and I was like, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> And um, so I started, I um, interviewed a few uh, friends uh, in, in Australia um, before we left. I interviewed a few friends and a few people that I admire um, and released those. Um, did a talk at Data Science Melbourne meetup just before we left, like the night before we left and, and said, like, I'm doing this podcast. Here's three episodes. Uh, have a look. Tell me what you think. Um, and then as we were traveling, wherever we went, um, I was looking up people that live there and met with them and was interviewing them, which was great. Um, so interviewed people in Japan, 
in the UK, in Spain, um, Portugal, um, Germany, few a few other countries, and um, yeah, it was it was an awesome experience. And uh, by the time we came and by the time we came back from from our honeymoon, um, the podcast had about five thousand uh, listeners. So um, yeah, when when I first started the podcast, I thought I would only do it while we were out on the honeymoon, and then I thought I would stop. But uh, but um, then it was it was going well, and I was definitely enjoying it. Uh, so so I kept going, and obviously still still going today. And now um, being year four, I've I've interviewed more than two hundred guests, which is crazy. <laughs> um, and like we've had the like the the chief technology officer from NASA um, come to the show. Uh, insane, like nuts. Or like we had Martin Ford, which is a futurist. And I had him like in the first year of the podcast, um, writes about, about AI and the future of work, um, wrote a book called Architects of Intelligence, where he interviewed um, like uh, Bengio and Hinton and like everyone who's doing the best stuff today or like cutting edge stuff today um that was yeah super super exciting we've had people on the show from all different industries like we had a head of data science from the formula one for example obviously we had people from like telco utilities and finance and insurance and, and everything but like we had people from like um head of data science from from like beauty products and yeah, across the board, it's been it's been awesome, um, and yeah, I'm super super grateful for for the opportunity uh, to create this content. I'm super grateful for the audience um, that that you know keeps coming back, uh, that you you share, you tell friends. Um, yeah, it's been like I feel I feel super lucky, super super lucky um, to be able to to do this. Um, so that was, and it's been yeah, amazing, <laughs> like actually amazing um then totally unexpected um but really really enjoyable um and and uh yeah so that started when i was in uh, doing my honeymoon and then when i came back uh, to australia um i went and worked for a mid-size uh finance company uh so a non non bank uh, which was interesting and this company was a group of group of about 12 companies doing loans and insurance different types of loans like home loans car loans personal loans um, business loans commercial real estate loans and then they had a lot of insurance for those type of products um so that was really good to be able to do data science from a group perspective and across the board and start um they did have they had data scientists there, but they were all scattered throughout the business. So we centralized them. They centralized data science, centralized um, data engineering, and uh, provided services to the group, which was super exciting. And the company went um, from like seventh in their sector, sort of in the in the finance uh, companies in Australia, from about number seven to biggest. Um, which was which was an awesome, um, and the company is now listed. So since uh, since I left, uh, they've gone public and they're yeah doing great, like really 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 good. And um, and when I left there, I moved to a healthcare AI uh, new company. So kind of like a startup, but it's um, it's a funded startup. So it, it was created as a joint venture between two companies, an Australian uh, large company and a US super large company. Uh, so they came together to start a new business who start, which started at the beginning of last year. And, um, and um, we, yeah, and I, and I moved um, from Melbourne to Newcastle in New South Wales, moved, moved here in February uh, 2020. Uh, so February last year and have been here almost a year and a half and loving it. It's been really nice. The work has been super challenging. Great to go into another industry. I've been in finance for the last five years and before then in consulting, kind of like going from here to there to everywhere. And now um, healthcare is something new, something where um, like I like that the aspect that you're helping people live healthier lives and applying AI machine learning to that. Um, 
there's obviously um, uh, a, a lot of people would know there's there's a lot of increase in the adoption of AI in healthcare and uh, the applications of it. I find that a lot of it focuses on on imaging, um, but there's a lot more that can be done. So um, in this company, we're definitely looking broader and we're providing products and services across the healthcare industry, which is excellent. Thanks for watching this video all the way to the end. I hope that you got a lot out of this discussion. And if you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe to the channel um, so more people can find out about the challenges that leaders have in the analytics and AI space. And that's what we're trying to share in Data Futurology. Uh, so please like and subscribe. And if you enjoyed today's episode, uh, please tell your friends. Thank you so much.